Welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and joining me, as always, is the wonderful Joe Stanley. Hello, Joe. As always, I'm thrilled to be here with you, Darcy. And this week is very much about cleanliness for me. I am not a clean freak, I will say, but I'm entertaining again. And in my house, we say nothing cleans like company. <laughs> so we're doing lots of cleaning. Well... I like a good clean-up too, Joe. I find it very cathartic when you get that done. I also like a good detox, as you know, on the inside too, with the occasional juice cleanse. Oh, you love a juice cleanse. I do. You're mad for I'm, it. I'm I just good. think you don't like cooking when your <laughs> wife isn't around. But it's anyway... There's a bit of a correlation there, fair point. So I'm, I'm not really much of a... I'm not a declutterer, but I'm really about germs and making everything look spick and span. I love a lovely, clean, white <laughs> kitchen bench. Don't you love that? You don't want crumbs. You don't want the jam from this morning's breakfast sitting there. I'm not into that. Well, I get that. Now, I, I really dislike getting taste mixed up. I find that a little bit disturbing, so I'm with you on that. You know, it's only about 100 years ago that germ theory came about, linking bacteria with disease. Before then, oh my, the way people lived was pretty gross. Strangers shared toothbrushes, communal cups at drinking fountains, and even beds in public lodgings were shared. <laughs> that is Brit full on, isn't it? But after the big germ fest, Things went the other way with everything being disinfected and scrubbed to within an inch of its life. And I reckon the food many of us ate growing up was probably overboiled and overcooked as a result of that new way of thinking. Well, bacteria and germs are unavoidable, really. They're everywhere. And it's argued, and I'm a bit in this camp, that exposure to that and the exchange of microbiome between people is actually a good thing, Joe. Well, why none of us want to become germaphobes or wrap ourselves in unsustainable plastic, it is good to be armed with the facts. And we caught up with our favourite food science professor, Dr Paul Dawson, for a hygiene refresher. Paul, you've spent the last 30 years researching how some of our most common food habits have increased the spread of germs. And I've just finished your TED Talk and had a lot of my misconceptions blown out of the water. Can you tell us a couple of the main things we need to know? Yeah, I think the one that seemed to get the most attention is the five-second rule, uh, that is dropping food on a surface and picking it up within five seconds is uh, keeping the food from getting dirty or getting bacteria. But that, that's a myth. Yeah, the, uh, uh, the study found out that the surface makes a difference as far as the number of bacteria that are transferred. If we, did we tested tile floor, wooden floor surfaces, and then carpet. And carpet transferred a little less However, the bacteria seem to survive a little better on the carpet, which you might expect because it's got kind of a pile there to protect it. Uh, we all, when we dropped dry food, like a dry white bread and bologna, and both of those picked up bacteria. There was some difference as far as numbers, but bottom and the, the, the take-home message is that if you drop food on a surface that has bacteria on it, it'll be on the food when you pick it up and eat it. I found that one incredibly confronting and had to reevaluate my own five second rule. I also saw that things like salmonella can last, we think, five seconds, but even up to four weeks on services. Is that right? Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, we inoculated tile with salmonella, given we did do high levels, but we tested it daily and weekly. Out to four weeks, you were still recovering viable cells or cells that could make you sick four weeks later. So I guess the take-home message there is if you don't know a surface, who's been on a, using a surface before, like a countertop, uh, you probably want to clean it before you start putting food on it you're going to eat. What are some of the other behaviours that we need to have a think about? I think you mentioned blowing out candles, sharing food, touching menus. There's a lot of buzz areas where I think we're a little bit too relaxed. Yeah, I guess taking those, as you said, in order, blowing out can birthday candles, uh, transfers from your air, the little water droplets that come out of your mouth, even when you're talking, like now I'm talking, there's little tiny water droplets coming out. Uh, obviously, blowing and sneezing, you're going to produce more and drive more. So if someone's sick and they're having a birthday party and they're blowing the candles out, they're going to be depositing those bacteria or viral particles on the top of the cake. So if someone 
is that the party that may be immunocompromised? Uh, they may may not want to share that with them. Uh, yeah, restaurant menus. If you think about it, everyone goes in a restaurant, probably touches a menu. If you put your hand in your mouth, eat a sandwich, whatever, transfer it again. So it's kind of surface to surface transfer. Kind of a recommendation there would be, yeah, order your food. Don't be afraid to go out to eat, but maybe you want to wash your hands after you order, uh, before you eat. Uh, if you're going to, especially having a sandwich, something mm. of that nature. What about double dipping? I have a feeling that my theory that if you turn the piece of food around and don't put the bit that's come from your mouth in, that it's fine, but I'm guessing I'm wrong there. Yeah, anything that, again, it's a surface to surface transfer, so you won't be transferring what you bit on your mouth, but where your hand was, will be inoculating the dip. Uh, and we did a, that study as well and tested salsa, chocolate dip, and cheese and found that there was more transfer to salsa when you bit and double dip than there was the cheese and chocolate. And that's because the salsa is a little thinner, so you bite and dip and more falls back in that was been in contact. Uh, everyone's double dipping in the room. You might as well be French kissing everybody in the room. <laughs> yeah. You've obviously done an extensive amount of research and I think there's so many practical takeaways that we can sort of reflect on now. What would you leave the audience with in terms of a couple of things you would never do? Yeah, one would be never uh, thaw meat in the sink or outside a refrigerator. Uh, put in a refrigerator to thaw it. Uh, don't wash your meat because that sprays bacteria that you don't want to, the raw meat uh, around the room. Uh, so those are two things that I think are common, not uncommon that people do that you really shouldn't do. The one thing I guess that is really common sense now and probably doesn't need to be said is really hands, you know, washing your hands whenever you touch the surface or think you touch the surface, shaking hands or doorknob or whatever. If you can, uh, this is a big one, don't touch your, you know, don't touch your face. In order to get sick, something has to get in your body and make you sick. So do your best to prevent that. So, Joe, you'd think the most disgusting thing in the home is probably the toilet, right? Yeah. Well, that's not the case. There's bathroom hand towel and the toothbrush holders, which rarely get cleaned, are where bacteria is rife. Oh, I can't even imagine how gross that is. Well, in the kitchen, ironically, it's the sponge we use to clean bench tops and dishes, which we then eat off. <laughs> That's the germiest. But basically, anything we touch all the time, our mobile phone, computer, keyboard, TV remote, all cesspits. What about this? Studies have found that one in six phones are contaminated with faecal matter. Now, that is alarming. <laughs> Don't take your phone into the toilet. That's all I say. Yeah. I say to my husband all the time, what are you doing? Put the phone Come down. On, Dad, leave it out. Oh, it's very disturbing and a very good reason to put those disinfectant wipes to use as well. Yeah, and a great natural germ killer is sunlight, Joe. And a little bit later on in the show, we'll look at how sunlight is being used to treat Parkinson's disease. We'll be back right after this. Hey, Joe, we love celebrating Aussie innovation right here on the House of Wellness, especially when it comes to advances in medical technology. We really are becoming a world leader in this field. Das, we are so lucky to have access to first-class care beginning from birth, and that's especially important for many families who have their babies prematurely. Some are critically ill, but giving medical care to someone so tiny is incredibly challenging. A revolutionary new device made right here in Melbourne is helping treat the country's smallest and most vulnerable patients Babies like little Nash, who was born at just 28 weeks and needed surgery on the very first day of life. Can I have a high five? Yeah! <laughs> Our little boy Nash was born at 28 weeks at the Royal Women's Hospital. I was in hospital for five days before they decided that um, he needed to come out um, via caesarean. At that point, we didn't really know what to expect. As soon as I had him, um, there was a team there from the NICU unit um, and obviously nurses and doctors, so he was whisked away. So I didn't get, you know, the normal cuddle straight away as you do when you have a newborn. 
and they had to put a breathing device on him um, to just assist him in those early hours. And yeah, it was a few hours later, while I was, whilst I was in recovery, that I was approached about this um, trial that was happening and asked whether I'd be interested in our family being part of that via NASH. I was approached and told about it by one of the, the midwives, uh, nurses there, and I was told that um, it's a smart catheter that gives a, um, a, a real-time monitoring of where the device is sitting in terms of how it is fed through to the main artery into the heart, um, which is how they're going to administer life-saving medicine and, and uh, drugs as they needed to. In the past, that has been kind of a, a situation where perhaps they've they've sometimes administered it in the wrong position, or they've you know positioned the device in the wrong spot, so they'd have to go in and do it again and again, um, or have to redo it with every time the, the baby needed medication. So for this, it was just like a surefire way that they knew exactly where it needed to go, and then everything could be administered through that. So from what we understood, it just meant a lot less trauma for him and for us, because as you can imagine, it's really challenging to see this tiny little baby. He was only 728 grams. So this tiny baby go through that time and time again. So it was just a lot less invasive for both him and us. Yay! Nash is now one year old. He turned one back in December. And on the 22nd of March, he turned one corrected, which means that is one year from when he was supposed to be born. So his due date. We're really grateful that he's actually I met mean, all of his developmental milestones and we, we would never know what that would have been like had we not been part of this trial. His early birth has kind of meant something in a way. You know, everything happens for a reason, as they say, and so we're really grateful that he's been able to be part of that and part of history in a sense, and that does make us really proud. Hey, what is going on? We'd like to think that his development at this stage now has a lot to do with those sort of choices that were put to us that we decided was best for Nash. And we really hope that whatever came from Nash's trials really does help benefit kids into the future. The Smart Catheter is a world's first and has already helped countless babies at Melbourne's Royal Women's Hospital. And joining us now is the woman behind this life-saving device, Professor Christiane Theta. Welcome, Christiane. Thanks for inviting me. Christian, you spearheaded the development of the catheter. Can you tell us why it was needed? Yeah, in the neonatal intensive care setting, we often have to place catheters um, for vascular access into the blood vessels of the babies because it's essential that we give them fluids, nutrients and medication. So we introduced little catheters either into the cord vessels or the vessels in the legs and arms and we thread them into the central part of the body. That's the safest location for the catheter and it's important that the catheter tip is in a very safe position. And it's referred to as the smart catheter. Why is that? The catheter we're using is actually a standard catheter, but we're connecting a device that allows us to use, to detect some electrical signals that come from the heart. And depending on where we are within the chest in relation to the heart, that ECG signal will change. So that allows us to actually determine where are we at the moment inside the chest. So the main technology is actually not the catheter part, but it's all the software that interprets the ECG signal and tells the practitioner at the moment you are not enough in, you need to go further in, you're into the heart, it's not safe, pull back. And how'd you go about designing a device like this and, uh, and has it tried well? Yes, it's tried well. It's actually been quite a project. We started in 2016, so the University of Melbourne started a course called Biodesign Innovation, and it brought together some business students, engineering students, and clinicians. And uh, I was one of the clinicians they asked, so I was very lucky there. And they said, is there something in your area? Is there a clinical need that's open to a technological engineering solution? So I had this idea about this technology a little while back and it was quite great. I met my five co-founders of the Navi Technologies and we started working on the clinical need. It's a, it's, it's a big area. You have to identify the need, find a technical solution. Um, there's all kind of work that has to be done, clinical trials. It's been quite a project. We've been working on it quite a bit since 2016. I imagine this device is uh, getting a lot of uh, interest and attention around the country and overseas. Where is it being used and is it uh, you know, attracting global attention? 
So at the moment, it's being used in trials at the Royal Women's Hospital, and the Royal Women's Hospital has been incredibly supporting us for this project. We are starting to talk to the Royal Children's Hospital to do some work there with a little bit older children. We've worked with some of the device consortia in the United States. Uh, one of our co-founders, Shing, went to Texas for a while and spent some time at Texas Children's and the academic environment uh, there. So it's, we've, it's, it's been quite a journey, and we are reaching out internationally um, to kind of uh, find collaborators for our clinical trials. Professor Christian, it is a fantastic story. Congratulations, uh, amazing work that you're doing and good luck with the, the device and all the work that you do and we really appreciate you coming into the House of Wellness today. Thanks very much for having me. Great stuff. The medical breakthroughs continue after the break as we shine the light on the latest treatment for Parkinson's disease. It looks a little strange, Joe, but the early trial results are remarkable, giving hope and relief to many. That's coming up after the break. Well, a little earlier, we looked at the smart catheter device developed in Melbourne that's being used during surgery on critically ill babies. It's a great story. The breakthrough is one of many being developed here in Australia. There's also incredible work being done to improve the lives of people who have Parkinson's. Trials of a revolutionary treatment that uses special LED lasers are happening now. People taking part in the trial say so it's slowing the progress of the disease, plus easing some symptoms. The Aussie scientists behind the unique therapy hope it could hold a vital clue to a disorder that affects 10 million people around the world. I always used to have this sense of I could take on the world. I was always a very positive person and Parkinson's tends to make you fearful, anxious. And since the treatment, I'm back to being my old positive self again and that's half the battle because no matter what you've got, if you can look at the glass half full, you're halfway there as far as conquering it and not giving in to it. Margaret Jarrett is not the kind of person to give up. After living with Parkinson's for over 10 years, she jumped at the chance to be part of a trial for a radical new treatment using infrared light. My voice was very soft and um, croaky and it was very slow. I was very slow, slow in moving and pulling my jeans up. It was like you'd think of something to do and you'd do it, but it'd be like in slow motion, a delayed reaction before it would actually happen. And using the laser, has brought everything back to how it used to be. Obviously, the light hat has done amazingly things for um, my speech and my sense of smell and, and uh, yeah, my handwriting. And my general demeanour has been more cheerful than it was. George Wilcox had a career in chemistry and was not about to let Parkinson's take over his life. He did his own research into light therapy and started using an infrared skull cap at home. Well, I did know about the fact that near-infrared light can penetrate flesh and bone, so I wasn't too sceptical at, at, at all. It gets right down to the, believe it or not, into the cell structure in the brain and affects what they call the mitochondria in the cell, which in turn increases the amount of um, neurotransmitters in the brain. The light therapy increases the energy or the metabolism in the cell and it has a flow-on effect on the cellular processes, uh, which include processes in the nerves and in the brain. Dr Anne Liebert's been using light therapy to heal ulcers and wounds and relieve musculoskeletal pain for over 30 years. But what her trial revealed was the positive impact of red light therapy, not just on the brain, but also on the gut. We put it on the abdomen three times a week and it is designed to decrease inflammation, which has an effect on increasing dopamine and serotonin and reducing the symptoms of Parkinson's. And we found that this was often the first symptom to improve and they were able to improve their gut symptoms to a point that it made a lot of difference to their quality of life. I've switched it on at the back, like so. George suffered chronic bowel issues as early symptoms of Parkinson's, but was unaware of the benefits of light therapy until the trial. 
I did the, the, the skull cap business for a couple of years, and then I, we went to a conference, uh, the Parkinson's conference in Adelaide in 2019, and uh, a lady called Dr. Anne Liebert gave a talk on light, laser light on the gut. And she was reporting some interesting results with um, altering the gut microbiome uh, makeup, which enabled people to to use their bowels more regularly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and ease constipation. So I thought, wow, that's interesting because the light hat hadn't done much for my gut, but it did a lot for my speech and my smell. So I thought I'd give that a go. The combination of the two treatments or the treatments by themselves have been giving a sustained improvement in um, people's energy, their um, ability to produce mitochondrial ATP and be able to have energy helps in their motor and non-motor skills. Is this a treatment you recommend for all sufferers of Parkinson's disease or is it something you'd recommend on a case-by-case -case basis? We would recommend this um, for all Parkinson's sufferers as there are no side effects or um, adverse outcomes but there are a small subset of people that are very sensitive to light that would not be able to have the treatment. So we would advise people to um, also consult their clinicians as well. I'm coping better every day. I'm doing just that little bit better. And I'm stopping declining, that's the most important thing, because I was a mess when I, when I first got diagnosed, didn't want to get out of bed. After a month, I had my sense of smell back. I went to voting, and of course there's the usual sausage sizzle, which I'm used to looking at, and not being able to smell the onions. And I could smell the sausages and onions, and I said to my husband, I could smell that, and I was all excited. Those behind the trial are stressing that red light therapy is not a cure, but it's giving people with Parkinson's new hope. As with anything, though, talk to your doctor before giving it a go. It may appear differently for all of us, but GQ, we all feel stress. 70% of Aussies feel like it impacts their daily life, with one in 10 reporting very high levels. While lifestyle factors do play a very important role in stress management, Heinze, there is a group of herbs called adaptogens which are also useful in this space. Well, it's all in the name. Adaptogens help the body adapt to stress. And one example is Siberian ginseng. This small woody shrub helps the production and secretion of the stress hormones cortisol and adrenaline. It helps us maintain physical endurance and stamina during stressful times and boosts energy levels. B vitamins also help us stress less. Vitamin B6 from things like fatty fish and dark leafy greens support healthy emotional balance. And vitamin B5 from things like meat, dairy and legumes is fantastic for healthy nervous system function and coping with environmental stress. You can also get these herbs and vitamins in a convenient high strength supplement. Another tip for looking after your stress GQ is going for a gentle walk and rumour has it, you're not going to be able to keep up. Can you walk on water, Hans? <laughs> the A to Z of vitamins is brought to you by Go Healthy's Pro Adrenal Support, a convenient, high-strength, one-a-day formulation to help support your body cope with environmental stresses. Coming up, Joe, the hobby that's more of a workout than you would think. Plus, you have to wear earplugs. It's a team sport with a very loud difference. Coming up next on the House of Wellness. Cleansing routines have been given a glow up thanks to technology. The result? Cleaner, youthful and more radiant looking skin, all whilst receiving a massage. The Finishing Touch Flawless Cleanse is a portable, rechargeable and waterproof device giving you a gentle yet deep clean. The standout for me is the soft silicon head, which is ultra hygienic. This is key when approaching the skin to avoid any bacteria. Because our days are varied, so too is the Flawless Cleanse, and it's actually a customizable device. It's got two cleansing modes, which help remove any dirt, oil, or makeup, and two massaging modes, which help improve skin's tone, firmness, and giving you that beautiful radiant glow. 
There's nothing more satisfying than starting and ending your busy day with a fresh face. And there's no one busier than us mums. So this Mother's Day, treat them with the gift of glowing skin. Are you listening, Milana and Valentina, my favourite daughters? <laughs> that was Jade with an early reminder for us to not only spoil the mums in our lives on Mother's Day, but every day. So, Das, tell me, what is what is a standout memory for you that you have of your mum when you were a kid? That is a very interesting question, Joe, because I have an extraordinary mum. She's amazing. But as you ask me that, oh, my mind's going to a memory of me being taken somewhere as a kid and then being it's to the point where I was in tears, didn't want to be there, and my mum magically appearing to save the day, which was... I was 18 at the time, <laughs> Joe, which is a little... <laughs> Despair when I look back. But you know when you just know your mum's always been there yeah. for you and I've been very lucky. I've had a, a beautiful mum who's been there every step of the way. That's really beautiful. You know what? One of the things I really remember with my mum, she's an English teacher and she instilled in me my love of books and language, which I'm very grateful for. But every Saturday morning we would make her a cup of coffee and we'd go up, she'd be in bed still, and we'd climb in with her and she'd read aloud from some of our favourite novels. And she did that right up until I was a teenager. We'd all snuggle into bed. And I have to say, I look back now and I realise it was as much about her wanting to just have time with us together, even in our teen years. It was really, really beautiful. Well, well, beautiful mm. said, Dan. And Willow, take note. We yes. need more of that time with it's your mum. It's never uh, too old to climb in bed <laughs> with me, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mother's Day brunch has become a bit of a tradition for us and for lots of families who hit town for a big family get-together, followed by a wander around the city. And one treasure that's slap bang in the heart of Melbourne is St Paul's Cathedral, Jo. It is such a beautiful building. Actually, it's one of my favourite buildings in the heart of the CBD in Melbourne. It's been there almost as long as the city itself. If I'm ever close by on a Sunday morning, I love the sound of the cathedral bells. Or if someone's getting married, you can hear it. It's gorgeous. You can you could be anywhere in the world. It certainly helps bring the city to life, yet most of us probably don't give too much thought about who's actually ringing the bells, Jo. Well, each Sunday, a different congregation that's not necessarily religious, gathers at the cathedral and makes the long, winding, steep climb up to the bell tower. And what follows is a rigorous 30-minute workout that's music to the ears of everyone down below. Every Wednesday evening and Sunday morning in Melbourne, an eclectic mix of volunteers meet at St Paul's Cathedral and hike their way up a steep spiral staircase. I think there's about 53 steps. I haven't counted them in a long time. Depending on your age, you're probably puffing in you know, for that extra breath. And now yeah, the stimulus starts. Bell ringing to me is the ultimate team sport, we're a team, and that's what I love. There's very few things that involved so much physical skills and mental gymnastics. It might sound strange to call bell ringing a sport, but spend a few minutes in the ringing chamber and you'll understand. There's definitely a workout involved. It requires good hand-eye coordination. If you're ringing the heavier bells at the back, you need some um, stamina and also strength. As you get older and your joints get a bit dry, or whatever they do, um, it's a very good exercise. With the bells at St Paul's weighing up to 1,500 kilograms, ringing them isn't nearly as simple as just pulling on a rope. Throughout this hobby's long history, ringers who don't use the right technique have suffered muscle tears, rope burns and even broken bones from getting caught in the ropes and hoisted to the ceiling. Go again. The, the challenge in the beginning is to handle a bell properly. Right? You don't injure yourself, you don't break the bell. Definitely the handling lessons are quite difficult at the beginning because you have to get the technique right. It's like um, just giving the right amount of push at the right time and the right amount of resistance at the right time. If you push too hard, you've got so much more resistance to fight against, and that's what uses up your energy. But bell ringing isn't just physically demanding. Once you've mastered the technique, the next hurdle is ringing your bell in sequence with your teammates by following a complex set of rules called a method. You've got to think in mathematical sequences, and uh, that's great mental exercise. Like keyboard instruments or anything else that requires mental and physical coordination is good for you. 
sometimes peals are rung. A peal is a marathon in bell ringing. It goes for typically three hours or so. It's a long time. And a lot of ringers claim in that at a certain point you almost go into a semi-automatic state. I think at the end of a, of a session, um, the, there's the adrenaline uh, racing or running around your body. So you, you feel quite chuffed, right? But I think you feel it the next morning. You know, you've had a uh, good night rest, but the next morning you feel a bit exhausted. <laughs> Antipodes is all about natural ingredients, so my belief is that ingredients from Mother Nature are not only good for you inside but also externally. So vitamin C is the ultimate skincare ingredient. It has three key functions. Firstly, protects the skin, that's due to antioxidant levels. Secondly, brightens the skin. And thirdly, boosts and supports the skin's natural collagen function. So skin is left luminous, glowing, and essentially a lot healthier looking. I'm thrilled to introduce DM, our vitamin C pigment correcting water cream. A key ingredient being kakadu plum. It's nature's highest source of vitamin C. So it has 100 times the vitamin C of a single orange. So highly concentrated, super safe to use in skincare and non-irritating to the skin. The DM's part of our Vitamin C Skin Glow range, and we have three other products in the range. Um, a gel cleanser, a gel serum, and also our Kiwi Seed Eye Cream. These particular products are all certified vegan. It's all about scientific green beauty, so bringing the best of New Zealand nature to the world. Good skin is healthy skin, and you can achieve that by using healthy, pure, natural ingredients an absolute champion of the pool who I love watching at the recent Tokyo Paralympics is swimmer Ellie Cole. She blitzed the competition again, winning one silver and two bronze medals. That made Ellie our most decorated female Paralympian with a tally of 17 medals overall, Jo. Oh, she is amazing. And Ellie has achieved so much, except for that one thing that's eluded her, a Commonwealth Games gold medal. And she's determined to change that at this year's upcoming Games in Birmingham, which she said will be her last before retiring. We caught up with Ellie before she hangs up her goggles for good. The doctors believed that I was born with a cancer, but it took a few years for my parents to realise that I was growing at a different rate to my twin sister. It took me a while to learn to walk, and um, I was waking up throughout the night in a fair bit of pain. And then the um, cancer presented as a lump behind my right knee, and they still didn't really think that it could have been cancer, and went to the hospital and they took a biopsy and came back and told my parents the news that, you know, their two-year-old daughter had cancer. I spent the next year doing chemotherapy. It was unsuccessful. I was getting too sick from the chemo. It was killing all of my white blood cells and the cancer wasn't reducing. And so after a year of just trying as hard as we could to fight the cancer, it just, it wasn't getting any better. And so they had to make the decision to amputate my leg. And to me personally, I think it's been the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Swimming is a really wonderful sport. It's not really a sport when you're doing rehab, but it's a wonderful exercise that you can do to learn how to use your body again, how to coordinate everything again without the impact and stress on your body, that extra impact that you don't really need when you're recovering. My first ever Australian swim team was when I was 14. You know, I looked up to Paralympians for quite a long time and I really wanted to be one. And so in 2006, I trialled for the, the Australian swim team to go to a world championships in South Africa. And I didn't really think that I was going to make the team, but I gave it the best shot that I could. And up until that point, I'd been swimming just at a local swimming club. And all of a sudden I was around a team of 25 to 30 athletes. The average age was probably about 25 years old and I was this little 14 year old kid who was probably in hindsight annoying everybody. But um, it was, yeah, my first experience at being at a, a huge swimming competition with competitors from all around the world and, you know, being able to practice just the basics of warming up, competing and swimming down again. 
We usually train nine times a week in the pool and those sessions go for about two to two and a half hours. And then we do three weight sessions a week as well. That's a lot of like just extra fitness touch-ups because apparently nine sessions in the pool isn't enough. And so we do a lot of like just um, bike sessions, Pilates, yoga, and then in between all of that, we have to fit in our physio, massage, you know, our dietitian and university all work as well. So it's a pretty busy life, but I've really enjoyed being very busy over my life because I don't know, when you've got less time, I feel like your time management has to, you have to rely on your time management a lot more. When we were in Tokyo, it was announced that we were going to have pay parity between the Olympic and Paralympic team. I didn't really think much of it. I was doing like a paint by numbers at the time, so I was pretty distracted. And then um, it, the moment just kind of sunk in that this is what, you know, my dad had been fighting for when I was a young athlete. This is what I'd been fighting for, you know, equal recognition since, since I was an older athlete. And I was like, wow, like this is a really historic day for para-athletes. And then I just got very emotional. I was by myself in my room. I, I couldn't stop crying. And I thought about, all of the Paralympians that have come before us that have always been treated differently and had never been equally recognised by our government in any way, you know, and we're in 2021 and that shouldn't be happening. And so to receive the news that we were going to be getting pay parity, it wasn't about the money for me, it was about the recognition and that we were equally recognised finally. I think that the moment that probably stood out to me most at the Paralympics, like being pretty selfish was one of my own events. It was the 100 metre backstroke at the Rio Paralympics because it was day nine of our competition. I was exhausted and I was like overcome with a debilitating sense of self-doubt that I've never experienced before. And so for me to be able to um, overcome that somehow and step out onto pool deck and still win the race, like I, I'm still unsure and quite blown away as to how I did that. And the experience of going through that much emotional turmoil in the in the previous two hours like that medal ceremony was really wonderful like it that that medal ceremony meant the most to me it's the only time i've ever cried on a medal podium <laughs> the well-being space i think has really come to light in the last three or four years i think that there's been a real need for it amongst athletes because a lot of athletes do struggle mentally but haven't necessarily had an avenue to speak out about it because if you were seen as struggling in any way, that was seen as a weakness. Whereas now it's wonderful, you know, we have the AIS Mental Health Referral Network. And so every athlete that is a funded athlete by Australia is able to access that mental health referral network and, and really take care of our mental health more than anything. Like it's changed so much and it's such an open conversation to have these days. And then once you start speaking about it to other athletes, you realise that almost every single athlete is going through like really difficult periods of stress in their competition as well as trying to balance their personal life as well. I'm involved in a global campaign that was launched by the International Paralympic Committee. Um, it's called yeah, We The 15 and it's, it's one of the biggest campaigns that the entire world has ever done for human rights, uh, for people with disabilities. And the aim of the campaign is mostly just to raise awareness, what people are doing in their own lives and in their own space. The We The 15 title represents the 15% of people with disabilities across the globe. In Australia, we actually have 20% of our population living with a disability, so a bit higher in Australia, but um, I've seen it's been received so well across the world. You never bring me down. And one thing that I've really noticed that I find fascinating is that a person with a disability is usually able to achieve much more than you can ever think that they can. And so, yeah, I've seen that time and time again in the Paralympic space. I've seen that time and time again in our everyday community space. You know, a person with a disability um, can always achieve more than you think they can. Das, I know you're a great sleeper, which makes me resent you a little, but <laughs> tell me, if you are ever up at night, what might keep you awake? I generally, when I put my head on the pillow, it's, it lights out, but it's just a family thing, you know? If something's out of whack with one of the kids or they're mm. upset, and that can get in your mind a little bit. And that is really 
because it's very rare when it happens. It's it's upsetting, isn't it? Because yeah. do you find you find it a little bit hard to get to I, sleep? I'm not a great sleeper, and often it is. Yeah, it's anxiety or worries or fears or regrets or you know, there's a lot <laughs> yeah. that keeps me up. I must say. to make me anxious just thinking about <laughs> all of that. Well, Sarah Davidson is a big part of the House of Wellness. Is four weeks into a six-week experiment that's been developed by the military that will guarantee you fall asleep in two minutes, Joe, by the end of it. It's all about relaxing every part of the body from head to toe, deep breathing and making yourself not think, which, <laughs> that how even can you not think? I don't know. Sarah still hadn't hit the sleeping sweet spot last time we checked in, but she's determined to crack the code. Good morning. It is the end of the fourth week of my six-week sleep challenge. I think my scepticism was what was really getting in the way for the first couple of weeks, but it's really starting to make a difference now, which really surprised me. Now I'm definitely falling asleep quicker. I can't say that it's two minutes every time, but noticing it's a lot quicker. And I think it's also the cumulative effect now of actually practicing a sleep routine of closing my eyes, visualizing the body scan, thinking about a really calm place. All of that is starting to really build and become a lot easier to fall asleep. So I wouldn't say it was guaranteed two minutes, but it's definitely happening more quickly, which in itself has surprised me. So experts believe it takes anywhere from a few weeks to 254 days for a person to form a new habit. If all else fails, Sarah's still got some time to make a new sleep regime stick, Joe. In terms of breaking a bad habit, the old saying that it takes 21 days has been proved to be a myth. New thinking suggests two to three months is more realistic, but it also depends on the individual and what habit it is that they're trying to kick. Which gives some insight into how hard it is to give up cigarettes, Joe. Oh, I think it's incredibly hard. I have huge compassion for people trying to give up cigarettes. There's lots of ways to give it a try, from cold turkey to phone apps and nicotine patches. Some people swear by acupuncture and hypnotherapy. There's lots of choices. We've often talked about what you can do to stop smoking, but here's what not to do, Joe. Don't switch to lower nicotine or tar cigarettes. Don't use filters or filter blocking products. And that's because there is no safe smoking option. The only way to reduce the harm from smoking is to quit. Quitting's the go, Joe, no doubt about it. And on that note, that is our show for today. Remember to tune into the House of Wellness radio show on Sunday with me and Gerald Quigley. And look out for the Wellness Plus lift out in your weekly paper with creative entrepreneur Samantha Wills on the cover. And thanks as always to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you again soon. Feeling.